When I look back on my life, I've come to the realization that coaches had a greater impact on me than any other group. Coaches made me have conversations I didn't want to have. They made me do things I didn't want to do to become something I didn't think I could become. And when I decided to become a coach, what I realized even further is that coaches compete on unique perspective, how they see what they do, unique education, how they know what they do, and unique experience, how they deliver what they do. Think about the great coaches in your life and the relationship that you have with them. They all had a saying. They all had a way of doing things. And they all had a way to meaningfully connect you to the game, to the team, and to the sport. The thing that I remember most about my coaches is that they knew how to communicate in short, powerful, emotionally compelling ways. And that led to deeper relationships and greater impact. My high school coach, Charlie Miller, would say to me, be the hammer, not the nail. My college football coach called it leverage over leverage to win on the offense and defensive line. When I started a college football team in 1998 with a guy named Norman Joseph, he said to me, Colby, my only job here is to help you take the next step. And Joe Calloway, who's a business coach to all of us and coaches the world, says things like, be the best at what matters most. And it sticks with you forever. It's the currency of great coaching. So what happens when we start to peer through the lens of coaching to look at words like innovation and social change. Business buzzwords, what happens when we get into the soul of those words? I was born to two coaches, well, educators, who taught me the way you take on the world is to become an educator and marry an educator and educate other people. And so that's what I did. And that was in Mobile, Alabama, at a school called St. Paul's. I call Mobile and St. Paul's the womb of greatness. It's where Mardi Gras started. And you realize at an early age, you can either get in the parade, or you can stand on the sidewalk and watch. I went to St. Paul's in Mobile, where people like A.J. McCarron and Jake Coker graduated and went on to win state championships and national championships. I'll tell people we set the foundation for greatness. We went two and eight along the way. At St. Paul's, I learned this one idea. My coaches taught me this. Innovation means you go first. You go first to what you want to become. In playing for Charlie Miller at St. Paul's on Saturdays, we would coach the intramural team. And it was fifth and sixth grade, boys and girls. And you had one game on Saturday, and I thought about it all Saturday, all week. And I'd lay in bed and I'd say, what can we do to win this game? The scores of these games were four to two or six to four. And so I'd say, what could we do to win this game? And while I was laying in bed with my Larry Bird three-peat poster above me, my little brother, Zach, was the only person that could uh, dribble on the team. We had 30 minutes. It was a man-to-man -man league. And you tell people in man-to-man -man league, you tell kids when you play defense, you go where they go. So I'm dreaming this up in my head, and I say to myself, what if I tell them we're going to have play number one? And play number one, Zach, you're going to bring the ball down the court. You're going to hold up number one, and the kids are going to go run to the stands and give their parents a hug. So Zach, Zach comes down, dribbles down, the kids set up on the blocks, they go run in the stands, the other kids follow them. <laughs> parents are laughing. He jabs to the left, lays it in, we win the game. <laughs> Two to nothing. Sandy Santoli, who worked with Coach Miller, he stopped the game and he came over to me and he said, hey Kobe, you're going to be a great coach one day, just not today. I'm waving the basket. 
that's an illegal play. But as I walked out of that gym, I said this to myself, I'm going to be a great coach one day. And right there in that moment, he showed me innovation means you go first. In that same year, we're playing UMS. They're down at the bottom of Old Shell Road. We're at the top. Coach Miller puts me in the game. He asked me to watch Bill Lambeer videos before I went in the game. I played basketball a lot like football. He puts me in the game. UMS is shooting free throws. Standing room only. He puts me in the game. I get the rebound. I take the best shot of my life. The only problem is it went to their goal. I pull my jersey over my head. I walk over to Coach Miller. Coach Miller's doing this. He puts his arm around me and he goes, Cole, might be the best shot I've ever seen you take. Now go sit at the end of the bench. Later, while I'm writing, I turn on HBO in the background or a premium channel and I listen to the movies or the documentaries because the writing is so good. And I hear the former governor of Texas, Ann Richards, say this, while the frustrations are great and the disappointments are many, there is no greater feeling in the world than when somebody looks at you and says, because of you, my life is better. And I think to myself, that's social change. So today I sit with you in a place called Old Hickory, talking about innovation. You go first, you go first to what you want to become. And social change, knowing that the disappointments are great and the frustrations are many, but knowing that we have the opportunity to look at somebody else and say, because of you, my life is better. And I learned that from coaches. I went on to college and I played for a guy named Tommy Raniger. My name is Colby, and Coach Raniger called me Corey. He thought it would be funny and said, why would anybody name their kid Colby? I'm gonna call you Corey for the next four years. Yes, enjoy that. We can't treat children this way today. Every August 27th, I call my dad, who was a coach and a teacher. And I'd say, Dad, I can't do it anymore. And he'd say, son, this is your choice, not mine. I'd go in there and I'd stare at Coach Raniger. I'd say, Coach, I don't want to play football anymore. He'd stare at me, which felt like an eternity. He'd say, Corey, go down there, put on your pads. Be on the field in 15 minutes. This guy blamed me one person for losses against other teams, and I never quit. In my senior year, when I'm saying to myself, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do? He says, this year's defensive lineman of the year is Corey. And I walk up and I shake his hand, and he said to me, boy, you've earned it. Again, showing me innovation means you go first. You go first to what you want to become. I went on and I started a college football team in 1998 with no phones, no computers, no players, no uniforms. We ended up 21st in the nation at some point during that year and I retired from coaching college football. Now to get that job, I called a guy named Norman Joseph. And I said, Coach Joseph, my name's Colby Jubenville, and I'm gonna call you every day until you call me back. 45 days later, he calls me back and he says, I don't know who you are, but you were certainly determined. Meet me at a Waffle House in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and tell me why you should be this coach. The year before, I coached at Petal Middle School or Petal High School, the ninth grade team, and I got into that interview. And we've all interviewed before in our first job. Imagine interviewing for your first job in a Waffle House. So I'm interviewing in this, in this uh, Waffle House in Hattiesburg, 
And he says, Colby, it's clear to me that you don't know anything about coaching offensive line. And I said, no, not really. And he said, but here's what I do believe. I do believe that you can help us, you can help us recruit the right people and win championships. I said, coach, if you give me the chance, I will stay and we'll build a program that wins championships. Again, innovation means you go first. You go first to what you want to become. I was born to two educators that taught me the way you take on the world is to become an educator, and marry an educator, and educate other people. And that's what I've been doing my entire life. I think the coolest part about my story is that my dad, Wayne Williams, was my stepdad. And he took my life over when I was one. And I call what he put me through the Wayne Williams School for Better Living and Better People. And I spent most of my time grounded as a child. I never saw him have a bad day. I never saw him get upset. And he had a whole lot of reasons to get upset. And he sent me to my room and he would say, you can either read books or you can listen to music. And so I, I instantly, you know where I would go to here, and I instantly went to, I want to listen to music. And so I'd go back and I'd flip through his albums, and they were the coolest albums. Led Zeppelin II, New Riders of the Purple Sage, The Beatles, Sgt. Peppers. But I came across this one album, and it's Don McLean, and it's American Pie, and it's that thumb with that American flag on it. And when I listened to that song as a kid, it's so different about what it meant to me then as what it meant to me in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, and today. But this last verse is the verse that stood with me my whole life, and it goes like this. I met a girl who sang the blues, and I asked her for some happy news, and she just smiled and turned away. I went down to the sacred store where I heard the music years before, and a man there said the music wouldn't play. And in the streets, the children screamed, the lovers cried, and the poets dreamed, and not a word was spoken because the church bells all were broken. And three men I admire most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they caught the last train, and I say to the Alabama Gulf Coast, because I'm from Mobile the day the music died. Why does that matter when we gather here today? At some point, the music will die out in all of us. And at some point, we'll have to say to ourselves, I'm going to go first again to what I want to become. And along the way, we'll build meaningful relationships. Meaningful relationships. And the definition of a meaningful relationship is when two or more people working together through interdependence towards a common goal. We teach adults how to be independent. I'm a middle child, so I got a little codependent. But ultimately, it's about interdependence. And along that way, through that meaningful relationship, we have the greatest opportunity in the world, which is to look at somebody else and say, because of you, my life is better. Thank you.